apologize in advance to anybody who's fluent in French for my mangling of uh, French place names that's about to follow. Here we go. All righty. So, all right. This is a drawing um, in La Maison de Homme uh, in Paris, France, and it's a copy of, oh, what happened there? Can I get rid of that toolbar? Yes, I will. <clears throat> Thanks, Val. You're a useful mammal. Um, and it's a copy of a uh, bison painted on the wall of uh, Altamira Cave in Spain. And uh, it was painted over 12,000 years ago. Nowadays, there are three different kinds of bison. There's uh, the European bison, uh, or Wiesent, uh, Bison bonassus. And then here in Wyoming and uh, other of the western states, we've got bison bison, the plains bison. And then in the forests of Canada, there's a subspecies called uh, the wood bison, uh, and that's bison bison athabasci. But at the end of the Ice Age, there was another bison species uh, that's now extinct, and that's the uh, steppe bison, bison priscus, and that's the uh, species depicted in uh, the cave painting. And uh, thanks to the um, artist's attention to detail and knowledge of anatomy, you can get a very good idea of what the uh, step bison looked like in life. Uh, many of the prominent features are clearly evident here, like for example, a very large hump over the shoulder. Whoops. Am I hitting the wrong arrow? Is it, is it this one? Oh, maybe I can try this thing. Let's see. When it comes to high technology, I'm a little bit like a, a caveman myself. <laughs> so the um, artwork of the Pleistocene is divided up into uh, three major periods. Uh, the first is the Aurignacian period, and that uh, runs from 34,000 years ago to about 21,000 years ago. And uh, the artwork of that period is generally fairly small and uh, consists of uh, um, outlines usually drawn in uh, charcoal or dark minerals with uh, very little detail uh, on the interior. It's what we would call line drawings today. And after that there's a 2,000-year transitional period where uh, it's a lot like the uh, Argnation artwork but uh, colored in solid black or solid red on the interior. And then from uh, 19,000 years ago to 12,000 years ago is the Magdalenian uh, period and um, that's characterized by much larger drawings of animals with uh, black lines on the interior to uh, separate major muscle masses and some really skillful uh, shading and blending of color, uh, usually different types of ochre, to uh, round out the muscle masses and give uh, the animals a more three-dimensional appearance. There are also uh, sculptures. Uh, these are clay sculptures from uh, a cave called uh, Touc de Dubert, also in France. And um, you can see one of the characteristic features of the step bison here. There's uh, a fringe of short hairs along the underside of the jaw and then running down the uh, ventral surface of the throat. Very unlike the uh, discreet, pendulous beard of very long hairs that we see in a modern plains bison. And here's some more examples of uh, artwork showing the head and face of the step bison, uh, showing the S-shaped profile to the uh, dorsal surface of the head. And then down there in the lower right-hand corner is a drawing of the living step bison. So taking all of that uh, evidence into account, and also um, evidence from frozen specimens. There's a beautifully complete step bison that was nicknamed Blue Babe that was found by gold miners in Alaska. And um, uh, <coughs> the soft tissues that were preserved with that specimen uh, confirm a lot of what we can see in the uh, cave paintings. And so uh, bringing all that evidence together, we got a drawing down there of the uh, living step bison's head that ought to be pretty close 
to the mark. Now, I did not draw this picture. It's from um, Frozen Fauna of the Mammoth Step uh, by R. Dale Guthrie, which was published in 1990. It's an extremely detailed and well-researched book, and if you're even remotely interested in this topic, I can't recommend it enough. It's really, really good, uh, fascinating detective, Pleistocene uh, detective story. One drawback, though, is that it has no color pictures. So here's uh, some more step bites, and these are from a cave called Niao in the Ariège region of France. And uh, you can see some more of their characteristic features. There's a, a mane over the neck that's uh, separate and discreet from the uh, hump over the shoulders. And uh, you can also see that there's a, a distinct step uh, at the rear of the hump, separating it from the more horizontal contour of the uh, rear portion of the animal's back. Now here's another drawing uh, copied from a step bison and painted on the walls at Altamira. And uh, when you see a step bison drawing like this that's uh, kind of all curled up in, into this shape, it's often because the artist was exploiting a natural irregularity in the wall or ceiling of the cave. Here's some bulges of rock sticking out of uh, one of the walls in the Altamira cave. And uh, you can see that they've painted bison right up on top of those. And so this is kind of uh, exploiting that contour of the cave in order to produce a more three-dimensional effect and uh, help the viewer better feel that they're looking at a, a real three-dimensional animal. And so uh, here's some more examples of step bison artwork. And at the bottom is uh, Guthrie's reconstruction of the back of the animal, showing that discrete uh, neck mane and uh, the prominent dorsal hump there. Now, of course, with cave paintings, we've uh, got a chance to see something that you would never, ever, ever be able to learn by studying fossil bones. Uh, a skeleton will never tell you what color the extinct animal was, but uh, cave paintings uh, often can, uh, and Altamira is one of the best examples of that. So we can see here that the uh, overall color of the steppe bison is a dark ochre, and then the uh, ventral mane under the throat is black. Uh, the neck mane is black and so is the rear portion of that dorsal hump is also black and then there's kind of a large wedge-shaped area running from just under the tail down to the elbow uh, of black fur as well so the overall impression you'd get looking at a step bison from the side would be of an animal that's black around the periphery and then with a, a lighter uh, side panel uh, lighter than the other the, the rest of it here's another uh, step bison drawing, this one from uh, Santimamin in Spain. And uh, you'll notice that there's a little dark triangle right behind the hump extending down into that lighter side panel. Um, you see that a lot in step bison art. So that little triangle there in conjunction with that wedge shape coming back from the tail uh, gives a sort of pipe shape, like a smoking pipe, to that uh, lighter area in the center of the animal's body. And so here's some more um, step bison showing those features that I just mentioned. And then once again down at uh, lower right, uh, Guthrie's reconstruction that ought to be pretty close to the mark, uh, showing us the appearance of the living animal. So in addition to the morphological differences between the uh, different bison species of the late Pleistocene, now we can use color as an identifying characteristic as well. So uh, here we've got kind of a key um, color coding these bison. Now if you're anything like me, and I know I am, um, <laughs> you might find it a little difficult to look down at the key and then up at the outline and down at the key again and hold a picture of the animal's colors uh, in your head. Well, um, I brought along some outlines of the uh, bison there together with the key 
Um, and I've also got some uh, colored pencils and uh, chalks and things here. So if you want to try your hand at uh, shading those guys in to reflect the appearance of the living color bison, um, go right ahead. I, I brought 20 of them. I was not expecting a crowd this size. But uh, if, if we run out and you still want a copy, then uh, you can come to the Tate Geological Museum at the uh, um, southern end of campus, and I'll be happy to uh, burn one off for you. So here's a, uh, bice, a step bison that I uh, drew. Um, the medium is Crayola crayon on brown paper grocery bag. Uh, so <laughs> then uh, after I drew this, then I crumpled it up and then flattened it back out again so that the paper uh, uh, mimics the rough contours of the inside of a cave. Uh, once again, if you want to try that yourself, I've got paper bags there, uh, crayons, uh, and uh, some sort of a Conti chalk. I got those at Hobby Lobby. They're all in earth tones, so you really can't go wrong. <laughs> Now, the steppe bison shared its landscape with uh, other uh, spectacular Ice Age beasts. Uh, one of the most famous is the great Irish elk, uh, Megaloceros giganteus. The great Irish elk was not exclusively Irish, nor was it an elk. Discuss. <laughs> At any rate, um, we know these well. Uh, dozens of skeletons of Megaceros, uh, Megaloceros have been discovered. Uh, they show that the animal was uh, two meters tall at the shoulder, and had antlers spreading three meters across from tip to tip. That's the biggest antlers, uh, and it's also the largest deer uh, that we know of, living or extinct. And uh, thanks to cave paintings, uh, we've got an idea of the uh, soft tissue and the color of the animal as well. Uh, for one thing, uh, there, the drawings show a dark triangular hump right over the shoulder, uh, very similar to the hump on the shoulder of a, mo a modern zebu cattle, and it's uh, colored in dark, darker than the rest of the animal. Then there's a line running from the rear portion of the hump uh, to the knee, and then often another line going from the front part of the hump down to the point of the shoulder or the base of the throat. Now we're not sure what those are exactly. It uh, could be a stripe, it could be a skin fold, or it could uh, mark the boundary between areas that are different colors or different uh, lengths or textures of fur. We're not sure. I showed these drawings to a friend of mine who's a bit of a gun enthusiast, and he told me that maybe they aren't actually, they don't reflect the appearance of the living animal at all. Maybe uh, they're butchering instructions. <laughs> uh, I drew a megaloceros here to reflect that hypothesis. Uh, but of course, other, other interpretations are possible. Uh, I brought along uh, blank drawings of the megaloceros there, and uh, again, if you want to uh, illustrate your own hypothesis, you're welcome to do that as well. Now, of course, the largest and certainly the most iconic uh, beast of the Ice Age landscape of Europe would have been the woolly mammoth. Um, people have been finding their bones for literally thousands of years. In fact, uh, finding mammoth skulls may have inspired uh, the legend of the Cyclops. The uh, very large nasal opening in the middle of the forehead might have been mistaken for an eye socket. Uh, medieval scholars uh, finding the bones uh, of the skeletons of mammoths figured that they were the bones of wicked giants that had perished in Noah's flood. Uh, later on, when comparative anatomy got better and people realized that it was uh, an elephant-like uh, creature, they figured that they were elephants that had been with Hannibal's army uh, that had gone AWOL and uh, wandered into France and died there. But uh, eventually it was realized that they represented a uh, uh, extinct species of elephant, and uh, cave paintings uh, showed some of their distinctive uh, soft tissue features. So this uh, drawing shows the distinctive double hump profile of the woolly mammoth and also the uh, long shaggy coat that gives it its name. So the um, uh, drawing up there is uh, from a cave called uh, Gunnersdorf in Germany and shows the mammoth's tail. Now the skeleton of a woolly mammoth shows a tail that's only about 60 centimeters long, which is much shorter than the tail of a modern elephant, which can get up to 160 centimeters long. Uh, also, we can see some very long hair coming off of that tail as well. So down there at lower left is uh, Guthrie's drawing of the mammoth's back end with uh, the tail. 
People have also found frozen woolly mammoths in uh, Siberia and a couple of them in Alaska as well. Now what you're looking at there to the left is uh, the ear of a woolly mammoth from a Siberian site called Katanga, uh, preserved, and that ear is only 30 centimeters long. Now, um, Guthrie's drawn it there to the same scale as an African elephant ear, uh, an individual that's the same age and the same gender as the woolly mammoth. And while the uh, woolly mammoth ear is like 30 centimeters long, the uh, African elephant ear, uh, ear could um, cover a bed. I mean, they're enormous. Mm -hmm. So uh, their, their ears are much smaller than those of modern elephants. And in cave art, uh, that's another <laughs> mammoth from Gunnersdorf to the right there. Uh, the ear is just very subtly indicated. Sometimes they don't bother showing the ear at all. Uh, here's a mammoth from Rufignac Cave in southwestern France. Um, notice the tip of the trunk there. There's two finger-like projections at the end of the trunk, the outer one larger than the uh, inner one. And uh, notice also the skillful way that the artist has shown the way that the foot expands under the weight of the animal when it steps forward. The uh, mammoth to the left is also from Rufignac, once again showing that double finger trunk. Now this is confirmed with, uh, once again, frozen mammoths. Uh, in the middle there is uh, the tip of uh, a freeze-dried mammoth found in Siberia that's been cut off. And you can see that the end of it has uh, those two uh, projections, giving it an almost mitten-like uh, appearance. This could have been used for manipulating uh, small or delicate objects, and also could have been used for grabbing grass and bringing it up to the mouth. Now, in the, you can see the uh, trunk's been cut. So in cross-section up there, you can see the two passages for the uh, nostrils, and then a pair of flanges on either side of the trunk. Uh, here's uh, Guthrie's comparison of the woolly mammoth trunk with the trunk of a modern Asian elephant, and it's uh, got a very different look to it. The flanges, it's hypothesized, might have been sort of a scoop, so these guys could scoop up snow and bring it up to the mouth and then uh, um, give the mammoth a source of water all year round, even when the uh, rivers and lakes were frozen over. Another nice thing about paintings is that they can give us uh, clues to the animal's behavior. So here's a pair of mammoths that appear to be fighting, and uh, this is uh, similar to modern elephants, male elephants getting knocked down, drag out battles, fighting over females. And um, mammoths undoubtedly did the same. In Lincoln, Nebraska, there's a pair of Colombian mammoths who died with their tusks locked together. Apparently they got stuck and couldn't get apart wandered around for a few days uh, and then died. Rotten luck for them. Good luck for us, though, because uh, you can clearly see that they are, were in a fighting position when they died. And uh, of course, our own mammoth at the Tate Museum, D, is missing the distal half of his left tusk, and that was probably broken off in a fight with another mammoth. If you see an elephant with a broken tusk nine times out of 10, uh, that's what happened. Uh, these are also from Rufignac uh, Cave in France. So here's a mammoth that I drew in uh, 2012 and uh, drew on all of the uh, evidence that I could find from cave paintings and from frozen mammoths. And this ought to be pretty close to the appearance of a woolly mammoth in life. This uh, makes drawing uh, some of these Ice Age mammals a lot more rewarding than drawing dinosaurs. Uh, when you draw a dinosaur, no matter how much good research you do, there's always a mystery factor. You know you got something wrong. You're never 100% sure that that's what it looked like when it was alive. But yeah, if you uh, do a bit of homework, uh, you can draw a woolly mammoth that ought to look just about exactly like the real thing. By the way, the um, hairs that have been found on frozen mammoth carcasses can get up to this long. They're like, they're like a meter long really long hairs, which means that the hairs on the belly and sides of the woolly mammoth were almost touching the ground. They would have formed a very long uh, skirt or fringe around the bottom half of the animal, um, especially in the middle of winter when the hair was at its longest. If you ever see a picture of a musk ox, that probably gives you the best idea of what the coat of a woolly mammoth looks like uh, in life. So yeah, picture an elephant dressed up like a musk ox and you've basically got a woolly mammoth. So at bottom is another uh, drawing from Altamira showing a, a wild boar, one of the fiercest of uh, Ice Age 
beasts in mid-leap. And then above that is uh, another drawing from Rofignac, and that's uh, a woolly rhinoceros, uh, Celadonta antiquitatis, but that won't be on the test. <laughs> and um, as, as they are today, um, Ice Age rhinoceroses would have been small-brained, uh, grazing uh, beasts with a very short temper. So this drawing shows uh, their distinctive features, the fringe of hair on the underbelly and a very prominent hump uh, over the shoulder. There's also some other lines um, that don't belong there uh, that were added by a, a mammal with a brain even smaller than that of a rhinoceros. Here's a, uh, another woolly rhino drawing. That one's also from Rufignac. And uh, below it, uh, the freeze-dried head of a woolly rhinoceros. I'm sorry, did I say mammoth? I meant rhinoceros. A uh, rhinoceros that's in a museum in Leningrad. Uh, the, the horn of a rhino is not made of bone. It's made out of keratin, the same stuff that your hair is made out of. And like hair, it rots away and leaves nothing very quickly after an animal dies. So there's rhinos uh, that we find, they're skeletons that are you know, from two million years ago, five million years ago. We have no idea what the horn looked like, none whatsoever. But with uh, woolly rhinos, we've been much more lucky thanks to uh, the frozen specimens. Uh, there's two horns. The posterior horn is round in cross-section and shaped like a cone and that goes uh, above and a little in front of the animal's eye and then a very long horn uh, on the nose, the anterior horn, uh, which can be over a meter and a half long and uh, it's flattened from side to side. Scythian traders would sometimes find these things and they thought that they were the talons of some enormous bird monster. Uh, so it's got a very distinctive shape to it. See, see the cross section down there showing the lateral flattening. The forward edge of the horn is often very straight, and then that straight portion there has a beveled uh, cross section. It's been suggested that uh, they might have used the horn as a sort of snow plow. In the middle of uh, winter when the snow is deep, they could swing that horn back and forth and scrape the snow off the grass and uh, be assured of a food supply all year round, and then contact with the grass would uh, um, wear the edge of the horn into that beveled shape. One of the most spectacular cave sites is uh, Grotte de Chavez in uh, southern France, and uh, that's the cave that has the largest number of woolly rhinoceros uh, drawings in it. And uh, they include a detail that a lot of people miss, and that is that there's a, a broad black band, like a saddle blanket, right across the animal's torso. You can see that on that top guy, and uh, that, uh, that bottommost guy, and then very faintly on that one uh, as well. So that would have given the animal certainly a very distinctive appearance when it was alive. Now, this guy up top, you've got the horn, and then you've got uh, kind of after images of the horn in front of it and behind it, uh, like, like, he's, like the tracers you see on acid. I've heard. Uh, anyways, um, and you see that a lot. Uh, you, you also, sometimes the profile of an animal's head will have those after images drawn next to it. Uh, legs sometimes have tracers, too, so that the, the animal looks like it's got a dozen legs. And people are like, well, what's that about? Why are they doing that? And then somebody hit upon the idea of looking at these um, cave drawings under natural firelight, a torch, seeing them the same way that the people would have seen it back during the Pleistocene. Up until then, all the investigations had been done with electric lanterns and flashlights. But when you look at it under firelight, flickering uh, at the end of a torch, then um, the light illuminates different portions of the irregular cave wall surface alternately and uh, emphasizes um, the uh, different after images alternately. So it pre creates a sort of strobing effect and almost makes the animal look like it's moving. Um, similarly with the legs, uh, you can get that flickering uh, flame light making the, the animal's legs look like they're moving. So it's kind of an ice age zoetrope, which is pretty cool. Um, over to the left, you can see the heads of some cave lions drawn on there, and also a reindeer. The reindeer is kind of hard to make out. He's right there. There's its antler. And more lions have been found at uh, Grotte de Chauvet than at any other um, cave site as well. Here's some more. Whole bunch of lions over there on the uh, right-hand side of the, uh, of the freeze. These uh, have a very distinctive look to them. You can see, like, like 
this one, for example, or this one. Uh, there's no mistaking the long nose and the heavy rectangular profile and the prominent chin of, uh, of the lions in those drawings. But what about this guy right here? There we've got a head that's uh, uh, rounder and the snout is shorter. The chin is much less prominent. And most telling of all, there's a black stripe running from the inside of the eye down to the corner of the mouth. Now, let me see if anybody's on the same page. What do you think that looks like? Does that remind you guys of anything? Ding, ding, ding. Yeah, that was my thought, too. Uh, that looks an awful lot to me like the profile of a cheetah. Now, as it turns out, there was a giant cheetah that lived in Europe during the Ice Age, uh, Asininix pardonensis uh, by name. But here's the thing, that, uh, as near as the fossil record, as near as the bones tell us, that died out about 400,000 years ago. But the illustrations at Chauvet were made um, only 30,000 years ago. So uh, this might be evidence that uh, the cheetah survived a lot longer in Europe than the fossil uh, evidence tells us it did. So it's something to keep our eyes open for is some much more recent uh, giant cheetah remains to be discovered in the future. But back to the lions. So uh, in the cave uh, illustrations of lions, uh, you never see a lion with a great big voluminous mane like you see on a modern African lion. None of them. Not even the ones that are unmistakably <laughs> male lions. Uh, so it seems that the, uh, the, the cave lion, uh, which by the way goes by the scientific name of uh, Panthera spilea, yeah, as opposed to the modern African uh, savanna lion, which is uh, Panthera leo. Anyways, yeah, so these uh, probably had a much shorter, uh, more reduced mane. You got a little bit of a mane on the top of the neck and then a, a ventral mane on, on the throat, uh, separated from the jaw by a, a distinct indentation. They seem to have had a, a tuft of dark colored uh, hair at the tip of the tail, like a modern lion does. And uh, sometimes they'll show a stripe on the side, which uh, might be a boundary between darker hair above and then a lot more light colored hair at bottom. And then down there at lower right is uh, Guthrie's uh, illustration of the live appearance of uh, Panthera spilea, the cave lion. And there were horses in Ice Age Europe as well. Um, at top is uh, a horse from Lascaux Cave uh, in the Dordogne region of France, and then uh, one from Niau uh, at, the, at the bottom there. These show uh, a kind of shaggy look to it. You can see a, a hair on the belly and on the underside of the jaw of that lower horse there. And I'm always impressed by how much energy uh, the artists have put into these, these horse illustrations. Incidentally, um, many caves owe their discovery to um, wandering dogs and curious children. Because uh, Lascaux, for example, was discovered when a dog um, fell into a crack in the earth and then the boys that were with him tried to get him loose and they pulled out some rocks. And, uh, and discovered the cave that way. Here's another horse uh, from uh, the Peshmeral uh, cave, also in France. And uh, this one has a black head and a black neck and then spots all over the sides and then a, a human handprint uh, produced in silhouette up top. Now, uh, one of the books I read about cave art said that the uh, spots there represent uh, projectile strikes and the handprint represents the domination of man over nature. I think that guy might have been overthinking it uh, a bit. Um, there were half a dozen species of horse in Ice Age Europe. Only two of those are alive today, and we do not know the color of the four extinct species. Modern domestic horses show that uh, there is the potential for a spotted coat in the DNA of uh, the horse family. So uh, it may be that there was an extinct horse with uh, this color pattern. As for the handprint, uh, that could just be the Pleistocene equivalent of the artist's signature. Now, as we've seen, these uh, cave paintings, when we look at uh, the modern fauna that um, compared to the cave paintings of animals that were alive back then and still survive to the present day, and also uh, compare them to frozen fauna that uh, shows the soft tissue anatomy, we can see that again and again, these guys really nailed it. They uh, portrayed these animals with uh, extraordinary, op oh, what's going on with that? 
I'll let it take care of itself. Um, so yeah, they, uh, these animals uh, give us a very realistic and accurate picture of what the Ice Age fauna looked like. So it makes it all the more perplexing when we come across something like this. What is that? Uh, this has been nicknamed the Unicorn of Lascaux. It's not a very good name because it clearly has two horns. It's more of a diplocorn. But uh, yeah, it's uh, an animal that is not known in the modern fauna and is not known from the fossil record either. Nobody has a clue what it is. Uh, it's got a uh, very rectangular sort of heavy squarish head there, a hump over the shoulders, and this individual at least is uh, heavily pregnant uh, to boot. So they probably had myths and legends and imaginary animals just as uh, the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans did. So this could be uh, an illustration of something that never existed, but there's always a possibility that there is an unknown beast in the Ice Age fauna and we haven't yet found its bones. So uh, who knows if there's a future discovery that'll solve the mystery of the, the unicorn of Lascaux. Uh, here's a... Uh, female deer uh, from Altamira, and it's a good example of how they could uh, use subtle shading of the red ochre in the middle of the figure to kind of round it out and give it a more three-dimensional appearance. And finally, uh, here's another um, cave painting from Lascaux. We've got some more horses at the bottom, and then above them is uh, an aurochs, Bos primigenius which is uh, the ancestor of the modern domestic uh, cattle. It was a somewhat different animal in some regards. For one thing, it was two meters tall at the shoulder and it was dead black all over and uh, apparently very uh, aggressive uh, and dangerous. And um, those uh, were abundant in the forests of Ice Age Europe. Here's another one, also from Lascaux. And unlike uh, many of the other Ice Age animals, the aurochs survived the extinction at the end of the last glacial. So they continue to persist in isolated wooded areas uh, all through the Middle Ages, where they were occasionally hunted by noblemen. It was considered a very great test of your ingenuity and courage to bring down such a huge and uh, aggressive beast. The last one died in a zoo in Poland in uh, 1627. So it's uh, fairly recent. Now, um, because these are descended, because um, modern domestic cattle are descended from the aurochs, that means that most or maybe all of the genes of the aurochs are still in our uh, domestic cattle fauna um, in uh, deactivated form, so to speak. In the 1930s, a German team set about uh, a selective breeding program, getting all the biggest, blackest modern cattle that they could, and then selecting the ones that had the horns that most uh, closely resembled the shape of the horns of the uh, uh, aurochs, and uh, after a while produced something that's really very close to the appearance uh, of an aurochs, probably the closest that will ever come to uh, seeing the living aurochs. In a similar vein, there are teams uh, at work now trying to clone the woolly mammoth from DNA recovered from frozen specimens. Now, whether um, these efforts will be successful or not, only time will tell. But in the meantime, uh, we can thank the um, Pleistocene artists, uh, the Cro-Magnons, who uh, preserve the images of these animals on the walls of uh, the caves. And in an artistic sense, at least, uh, those living animals are still with us. Well, thank you all very much. I'll uh, take any questions you might have. And yeah, oh, yes. Okay, Russell, it seems like almost all these animals have that home. So what do they think that's about? Why do they all have a home? That's a very good question. Um, the, the hump has a, a functional purpose. You've got animals that have a very large, heavy head, and uh, in, uh, in mammals at least, when you've got a large, heavy head, uh, you need to sling it with tendons and ligaments to a, um, um, a, a tension member. So usually those are elongated 
neural spines coming off of the anterior thoracic vertebrae. So that hump there is for anchoring those tendons, and then they run down the animal's neck and attach to the back of its head, and that helps it hold that big heavy head up. Now in some uh, lineages, like the bison, for example, it might also have been a display feature. Um, a modern American Plains bison has a big heavy head, but those uh, thoracic spines are even longer than they have to be in order to provide enough leverage to hold that head up. And that might uh, also help it look bigger and more intimidating to, uh, to rival bison. Why exactly, though, these humps were so popular back during the Ice Age, uh, I, I don't know for sure. Um, it's a good question. I'll look into that. Alrighty, if anybody wants to uh, grab uh, papers from the top, uh, then, um, or even color them in here, if you're in the mood, uh, you're welcome to. All right, thanks again. Oh, oh I'm sorry, I had two, another question. Yeah, um, on the ones where, the, where there's, what you were saying, it's shaded, the whole crew is shaded from lighter to darker, do we, how do we know that that is probably done on versus, versus having some natural water running down there and washing part of it? Well, um, for one thing, uh, water action would always concentrate more of the dark uh, towards the bottom of the figure rather than the top. But you find a couple of muscles that are shaded the other way around where they, uh, they put, or if it's an animal that was darker on top and lighter on the bottom, uh, then we've got that. And also, it's just too damn good. Uh, to, I mean, they did just a really good job of, uh, of doing that shading, too much so for it to be an accident, you know. Uh, the mammoth on your tie. And yeah, I wore my mammoth tie. I figured if this isn't the day to wear the mammoth tie, then what is, right? Okay. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you.